Good afternoon from the Chile Copenhagen. Welcome to the webinar Unlocking Clean Energy Finance and Investments for Green Hydrogen, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency and broadcasting from the UN City. My name is Arius and I'm working as a project officer at the Copenhagen Center. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar will be about 60 minutes long, including time for Q&A at the end. If you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and the recording of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System. And we have many other webinars and information there. Have a look. I'll give more information in a few minutes. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The Center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. The Center has an established network of global, regional and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. On a regular basis, the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency is conducting webinars. All materials, including recordings and presentations from previous webinars, can be found on Copenhagen Center Knowledge Management System under the e-learning section. The material of today's webinar will be uploaded shortly, but until then, you can check one of the many webinars on various topics that have uh, been published. Finally, I would like to inform you that you can send us your questions during the webinar using the dedicated icon, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. If we run out of time, we'll try to post the answers to Copenhagen Center Knowledge Management System. We will let you know by email when the recordings and the responses will be ready. Now, I would like to give the floor to my good colleague, uh, Dr. Romana Savikas. Having a recent energy crisis, the fuel diversification, reliability and security became a very hot topic. Due to energy crisis, one part of countries considering to increase the share of hydrogen consumption as consumers, another part of the countries as continents as Saudi Arabia or Africa are exploring hydrogen potential for export. In all these scenarios, we see that the global decarbonization can be reached only by employing carbon-neutral fuels as green hydrogen produced from renewable energy sources as solar, wind, hydropower. The future is about of integrated energy systems as thermal, heating, cooling, electricity, renewable and all other systems which needs power backup during peak loads. And green hydrogen can be one of the means to employ solar, wind, energy surplus into a field for peak capacitors, for example. Of course, hydrogen is also used in industry and many other applications. So continuing this discussion about hydrogen, today we have invited a very interesting speaker, Joseph Kordiner. Joseph works at uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, in the Environment Directorate. Within the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization team, he supports the development of policies and instruments to help scale up a pipeline of bankable projects for the decarbonization of the industry in emerging economies. Together with Degar Saijin, industry lead uh, of uh, industry program, he has co-authored a framework for industry in a zero transition developing financial solutions in emerging and developing economies this year, which will be implemented in several partner countries of this program. Joseph today will present some findings from the forthcoming publication of the CEFIM industry program, Green Hydrogen Opportunities for Emerging and Developing Economies, Identifying Success Factors for Market Development and Building Enabling Conditions. Prior to joining the OECD, Joseph has worked almost 10 years in steelmaking industry in several European countries as analyst of energy markets, business developer of industrial joint ventures, and he was a head of the carbonization strategy. Joseph will talk about enabling conditions and success factors of green hydrogen projects in large-scale industry. After Joseph's presentation, we will have a very interesting discussion with Joseph. So I'm asking the audience to stay tuned up up to the end of presentation and after to listen to this discussion. So please, Joseph, the floor is yours. 
Hello, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to present um, the work of the OECD on the enabling conditions and success factors of green hydrogen projects in large-scale industry, uh, which largely relies on the forthcoming working paper that we will release in November 2022. So first of all, let me present the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization Program uh, where I work. So we are part of the Environment Directorate of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we are a country-focused program working with seven large emerging economies, uh, namely um, India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Egypt and Colombia. And our main mission is to uh, propose measures in order to unlock capital and mobilize um, finance for clean energy. And by clean energy, um, we mean uh, renewable energy energy efficiency and starting this year industry decarbonization. We carry out um, four, main, four main families of activities. Um, so first, uh, we draft clean energy finance and investment roadmap. Um, so these are policy reviews and uh, action plans that we uh, build together with government. And we are, for instance, carrying out um, at the moment uh, a roadmap with India, uh, which is focusing on uh, energy efficiencies for uh, small and medium enterprises, offshore wind and green hydrogen. Um, we also um, support investor dialogues uh, using as well uh, the, the convening power of the OECD uh, to bring together uh, the government, private financial institutions and um, public funds. Um, third, um, we also foster regional peer learning. Um, so as I have explained, uh, we work with seven large emerging economies, which have a lot of commonalities. And we also uh, build upon the large OECD network to organize uh, fora and workshops where um, stakeholders from different um, countries can also gather and uh, learn from each other. And the last uh, of our activities, which we have developed this year and um, which is the, the overarching um, program uh, to which this green hydrogen work belongs, is uh, the work on industrial decarbonization. And uh, more specifically, we have designed an industry framework, so um, a framework for the net zero transition of the industry. Uh, and this is a step-by-step -step methodology where we propose to uh, identify projects and identify regulatory and financing solutions to help decarbonize a certain focus area, which can be a specific industry sector or uh, a specific cross-cutting technology such as green hydrogen. And um, our target is to implement this industry framework in several of our partner countries, starting with Indonesia and Thailand uh, as of uh, the end of the year. Um, so in terms of timeline uh, and the um, green hydrogen uh, work that we have carried out so far, so um, we organized in June 2022 a stakeholder webinar uh, gathering representatives from our partner countries, international organizations and um, industrials and experts from the green hydrogen sector in order to, to discuss um, a large part of the um, challenges faced by the green hydrogen ecosystem. And that also enabled us to select a focus for our working paper which we will release in November 2022, uh, uh, and which will be, um, as mentioned, the enabling conditions to build successful 
business models uh, with a focus on emerging economies. Uh, after um, the release of the paper, our work on green hydrogen will continue. Um, first, by continuing to uh, identify case studies and uh, analyze the, the policy frameworks to, to understand what are the most efficient measures to develop green hydrogen, uh, but also possibly um, to uh, implement some proposals and identify projects as part of the industry framework. So a short presentation on uh, the green hydrogen contributions to the uh, decarbonization of uh, the economy and uh, the purpose to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Um, so green hydrogen, uh, which is produced uh, using renewable energy sources like uh, wind, solar or hydropower, uh, has the potential to contribute to the low carbon economic transition. It is cross-cutting energy vector and therefore can help uh, decarbonize end use sectors like the heavy industry, uh, as well as integrate higher shares of variable renewable energy sources, uh, such as solar and wind, into the energy system. Um, so it's, it is worth um, noting that the relative role of green and blue hydrogen might differ between scenarios. Both are usually categorized as low carbon hydrogen. Uh, but for instance, the uh, IRENA 1.5S scenario, which you can see on the uh, left side chart, uh, suggests that two thirds of uh, the 600 million tons of hydrogen that will be needed by 2050 will be green. And overall, uh, green hydrogen role in the global energy transition scenarios uh, vary for a wide array of reasons. Um, one of them being uh, the ambition of the scenarios in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Another one, uh, the underlying enabling policy assumptions. Um, and lastly, uh, the penetration rates of the technology options across sectors, uh, which are usually uh, very linked to the cost assumptions of these long-term scenarios. Uh, yet on uh, the left side chart, uh, you may see that uh, many scenarios um, account for a share of global hydrogen, uh, share of the total final consumption of energy in 2050 to range between 10 and 20 percent. So this is the case for most of the scenario uh, that are on the second part of the chart. Um, and on the right side chart, you may see uh, that, the, uh, that many technologies will be necessary to uh, reach net zero emissions by 2050. So low carbon hydrogen is clearly identified as one of them. Uh, but of course, this needs to be assessed uh, as well uh, and complementary to the development of uh, renewable energy sources, uh, the development of further electrifications, um, and specifically for hard to abate sectors, uh, the potential to develop as well carbon capture use and storage. So in our work at the um, OECD Environment Directorate and the CEFIM team, we focus mainly on the role of green hydrogen for emerging and developing economies. And the goal is really to understand what the enabling market conditions to set up viable business case are and how the actions from policymakers can contribute to this. Um, very often, the emerging and developing economies are at a very early stage of developing their hydrogen plans, and they need to identify the most promising use of hydrogen for their domestic economy. So the hydrogen production uh, can be used in multiple sectors, um, industry, transport, power systems, for instance. Uh, but in any case, it requires significant capacity of renewable power and uh, for this reason, in terms of decarbonization, uh, the global trend is to prioritize applications where 
direct electrification cannot be implemented. For how to abate uh, sectors such as heavy industry, and as mentioned in the previous slide, the available decarbonization options are limited. And this is the reason why these sectors, uh, such as the fertilizer, uh, the steelmaking, the development of methanol or refining, are often considered as no regret use when um, there are analyses to prioritize the potential applications and usages of green hydrogen and its derivative. So hydrogen derivatives could be uh, typically the development of green ammonia uh, based on uh, green hydrogen. So hydrogen is currently consumed mainly by the manufacturing industry as a feedstock in chemical processes and as well as reducing agents in steel plants. Um, around 95% of hydrogen production is based on fossil fuels, um, mainly natural gas and, and coal, and is produced on site in petroleum refineries, uh, ammonia plants or steel plants. Uh, the total hydrogen demand from the industry was uh, around 90 million tons per year in 2020, which is most of the um, total demand of 100 million tons per year that you can see on the chart. By 2050, green hydrogen is projected to have a large market share in several sectors, um, and for instance, um, ammonia and methanol production. So here, um, the use of uh, green hydrogen can substitute the current fossil fuel-based hydrogen uh, in steam methane reformers, in gasifiers, and uh, hydrogen can as well help uh, providing clean transport fuels for shipping. Um, second, in iron and steel. Um, so in order to replace natural gas in the process of uh, direct reduced iron, which we will um, deep dive into a bit later in the presentation. Uh, and this uh, green hydrogen fueled steel can replace uh, partly traditional blast furnaces and eliminate coal use in steel making. Um, it's also paramount uh, to use a value chain approach and um, have a holistic vision of the green hydrogen ecosystem to develop national strategies. So we have seen uh, the importance of uh, identifying priority sectors, but uh, beyond the applications, uh, understanding the role of the upstream resources or electrolyzer manufacturing also plays a critical role. Um, so a number of key elements uh, needs to be assessed. So Typically, the infrastructure availability. Uh, in some regions, uh, the risk of water stress. Um, for the manufacturing of electrolyzers, the access to critical minerals. And all these can contribute to um, identifying uh, what could be the main barriers in developing a green hydrogen economy in a specific country. So there is really this need to understand the complexity of the hydrogen value chain and a country with a large base of industrial hydrogen consumers like refineries or fertilizer industry could, for instance, prioritize these applications. Um, of course, on top of the choice of domestic usages, a country can also develop green hydrogen exports to promote the development of the entire value chain. Um, and for instance, um, countries uh, who have large resources for renewable power at low cost uh, can develop the entire value chain from this capacity to produce the products derived from green hydrogen, such as green ammonia or green steel. And these export routes may in the future play a major role as well um, to develop the global trade of green hydrogen. So for countries, um, after having defined national priorities, there is as well 
the need to identify the barriers for uh, economically viable business cases and to propose regulatory and market solutions. So um, what we have done uh, during our um, webinar uh, on in June 2022 is that we organized an online stakeholder consultation so with uh, 100 experts from the governments, the industry, financial institutions, think tanks, research organization, and uh, a few other stakeholder groups. And uh, this consultation, uh, supported by uh, preparatory test-based research, pointed to three key areas that are important for the green hydrogen value chain and uh, the creation and growth of the green hydrogen markets um, at country level. So um, we have left aside um, the technology and industrial development, uh, which other agencies are covering. And uh, therefore, the three main areas we are focusing on are the following. So first, um, the strategy, governance and standards, uh, which includes uh, elements such as building integrated roadmaps, uh, including energy, CO2 emissions and green hydrogen developments. Uh, this also includes um, establishing a regulatory framework that is aligned with uh, clear national targets. Um, and third, um, this also involved the quality of the licensing and permitting process. So uh, this strategy and governance part is, is the first focus area that we have identified. The second focus area is uh, creating an enabling uh, environment and uh, enabling market measures. Um, so this highlights the potential to achieve sustainable green hydrogen markets that would not rely on support and subsidies in the long term, uh, but rather on uh, demand for green products. And uh, the third key area that was identified during the stakeholder consultation is the need to implement de-risking investment mechanisms and financing solutions. Um, elucidating factors that could affect financial risk perceptions among investors and uh, that could describe the ability of the financial ecosystem to invest in local green hydrogen projects. And for this reason, and based on these uh, three areas, our uh, forthcoming study provides a small toolbox with three elements. So um, these are the boxes that are described on the slide. The first one is a list of statements across the value chain to support policymakers to carry out a preliminary self-assessment of the country's potential to develop green hydrogen and identify where to position in the value chain. Uh, then we also propose a checklist comprising of uh, 45 questions along the value chain. And this checklist was prepared to support policymakers in identifying the main barriers to investment in green hydrogen projects considering their national circumstances. Um, and the third element of this uh, toolbox um, are eight case studies of green hydrogen projects, uh, focusing mainly on emerging and developing countries, identifying the commonalities and specificities of uh, enabling market conditions and financing mechanism that can foster the development of uh, green hydrogen. So I have uh, also listed on the slides uh, five studies uh, out of this, out of the eight that we have developed, uh, and I will briefly describe them. These are uh, the case studies that focus on the industry. Um, so, first, H2 Green Steel uh, is a company headquartered in uh, Stockholm. Uh, it was founded in 2020, and aim and they aim to build a large-scale green steel production facility in northern Sweden. Uh, in Bottom. Uh, they will use a combination of renewable electricity and green hydrogen, which can enable to eliminate almost all the CO2 emissions from the traditional steel making process. So in terms of um, project size, um, they plan a 700 megawatt uh, capacity of uh, alkaline and proton exchange membrane electrolyzer, um, as well as a direct reduced iron plant with a capacity of 2.1 million tonnes of steel per year. 
which will be the base uh, to produce 2.5 million tons of finished steel products thanks to uh, steel scrap additions. Uh, they could as well have um, a capacity expansion in a second phase of the project. So the second case study is uh, HIF uh, Global, uh, which develop Hapukoni, which is uh, an e-fuels production project in southern Chile. So e-fuels, uh, which sometimes are also called synthetic fuels or electrofuels, are liquid fuels manufactured by combining captured CO2 with green hydrogen. And when the e-fuel is burned, it releases uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, but this is an equivalent amount to the amount that is captured during the production process. And that is why e-fuels are uh, considered as carbon neutral or as a low carbon footprint fuel. So uh, HIF Global has uh, reached final investment decision in 2021 for the demonstration plant. Uh, and the construction is uh, actually set to begin uh, this month. So with this project, um, they will have renewable electricity uh, produced uh, on site by a 3.4 megawatt onshore wind tur turbine. And this will power a 1.2 megawatt electrolyzer in order to produce uh, 140 uh, tons of green hydrogen annually. Um, the, the purpose of this demonstration plant is also to uh, validate many technology blocks. So uh, the hydrogen will be here synthesized with uh, CO2 captured from the atmosphere with a direct air capture system. Uh, and then uh, combined in order to produce low carbon e-fuels. Um, the target for these e-fuels is that they will have uh, exactly the same uh, physical chemical characteristics as um, gasoline or uh, liquefied petroleum gas. Um, so even if this demonstration plant is uh, still limited with an annual production of 130,000 liters of e-gasoline. Uh, the project should ramp up uh, quite quickly and reach 66 million liters annually by 2025, um, with the construction of this second phase that is uh, targeted uh, to begin by the end of 2023. So this uh, scale-up production of uh, this second phase, which is called uh, Cabo Negro, will uh, enable to produce the same uh, quantity of e-fuels as the annual consumption of 50,000 cars. Uh, and this will rely on a wind power capacity of uh, 325 megawatts and electrolyzer capacity of 240 megawatts. Um, in, the, in parallel, uh, HF Global uh, aims to further scale up capacity uh, and develop other projects both in Chile and abroad. Um, so the third industrial case study that we have is uh, Hyphen Hydrogen Energy. So it's an Namibian company established uh, to uh, facilitate, to, to create production facilities in Namibia, uh, both for domestic, regional and international markets. Uh, and the company uh, was selected in November 2021 by the Namibian government to develop a large-scale, vertically integrated greenfield green, uh, green hydrogen projects that will be co-located with a deep water port to facilitate exports. Uh, so the project consists of uh, 5 gigawatts wind and solar energy capacity that will be integrated with 3 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity where uh, the surplus of electricity could be uh, used domestically but also exported to neighboring countries. Uh, this project will enable to produce around 300 kilotons of green hydrogen, um, which will then be used to produce 1.7 million tons of ammonia per year. So this um, amount corresponds uh, to around 1% of the current global ammonia production. The total cost of the project is estimated to be around uh, 10 billion dollars, and um, given this huge amount, the project will follow a two-stage process, 
Um, so the phase one will already require an investment of uh, 4.5 billion dollars and uh, it will produce around 0.7 million tons of ammonia. Um, so the, the next case study is the port of Sohar. So this is a deep sea port in Oman uh, and next to it there is an economic free zone uh, which covers 4,500 hectares area uh, and uh, already 500 hectares are uh, leased uh, in this economic zone. So the purpose is to attract various projects of renewable electricity, green hydrogen production and industrial goods production from green hydrogen. Um, the, the port and the free zone are managed by a joint venture uh, that has been set up between the port of Rotterdam and the Sultanate of Oman. Um, so to take one example of projects in the economic free zone, uh, so uh, there is a partnership between uh, hydrogen rice, Jindal uh, Shadid Iron and Steel and uh, the Soha port and free zone to develop 35 megawatt electrolyzer capacity combined with a solar power plant by mid-2024 with the purpose uh, to use the hydrogen uh, to replace natural gas in the production process of uh, Jindal uh, Shadid Steel Plant. Um, Subsequently, the purpose of uh, this partnership is to develop a uh, 10 times larger electrolyzer and to reach uh, 350 megawatt electrolyzer capacity uh, in the mid-term. So some updates on these first case studies and further examples will be posted on um, our website uh, as the projects develop. Uh, and we're of course happy to exchange with further project developers to complement the current insights with uh, the experience from the ground. Uh, um, so we are now starting the second part of the presentations where we will um, first highlight the complexity of building profitable business case uh, with the example of green steel production. Um, then in the following slides we will also present some key lessons learned from the case studies um, that I briefly described. Uh, and finally, summarize uh, a few measures and levers that can create an enabling environment uh, and illustrating it with uh, the role of blended finance. So um, iron and steel is a hard to decarbonize sector for which green hydrogen is identified as a key lever for reducing emissions. Um, the sector is responsible for around 8% of global final energy demand and about 7% uh, of energy sector CO2 emissions. Um, it's important to know, just as a brief introduction, that two main metallic inputs are used to produce steel, iron ore and recycled steel scrap. Uh, and there are three main processes uh, today to produce steel. The first one is uh, based on blast furnace and basic oxygen furnace. Uh, so this is the so-called BF, BOF route. And this rely mainly on iron ore and coal input in the blast furnace. Uh, and then uh, 15 to 25 percent scrap additions that is put in the uh, basic oxygen furnace. Um, the second production route that is also uh, commonly developed is the uh, scrap-based electric arc furnace where um, steel scrap is uh, uh, melted uh, thanks to uh, an electric arc. And the third main production route uh, is uh, to have direct production plants combined with electric arc furnace. So in this process, the iron ore is, or iron pellets are first reduced in, in the shaft furnace, uh, typically with natural gas and uh, they produce direct reduced iron, uh, which is called DRI. Uh, and this DRI is then mixed up with scrap with inflexible proportion in an electric arc furnace. Um, so today, a large share of the steel scrap is already recycled worldwide. Um, and the steel scrap is recovered at various stages of the life cycle of products. Uh, for this reason, the steel scrap recycled today is in average 20 years old. And in parallel, uh, 
as still is necessary in many applications such as uh, cars, buildings, infrastructures, uh, energy generating systems or um, appliances. Uh, it's necessary for the development of the economy and the global steel demand is increasing. Um, therefore, there is not enough steel scrap today to satisfy the current demand and primary steel production relying on iron ore as a main input remains necessary. Uh, this is the reason why today, even though most of the steel scrap is recycled, around 70% of the total metallic input to steel production globally is derived uh, from iron ore. Uh, for primary steel making, um, blast furnaces remain the main production route, uh, but there is an increasing focus on the uh, DRI EAF route, because natural gas could technically be fully replaced by hydrogen in that process. And of course, if the hydrogen used uh, is green, that would also significantly abate the CO2 emissions of primary steel making. Yet there are many challenges, um, technological, industrial, economic, for the, for the large scale development of green hydrogen based DRI, even though many steel makers around the globe have already announced projects to switch to these technologies. And understanding the breakdown of investment and annual costs across the value chain is a necessary step uh, to identify where policy and financial support will be needed to reduce costs. So the business case that we present here uh, provides orders of magnitudes based on generic assumptions. And even though the assumptions may vary depending on each country, each project and on the market price evolutions, uh, this can already help um, drawing general conclusions on the challenges associated with building profitable business models, creating an enabling environment for green steel production, um, and helping policymakers identifying uh, the main measures to take. So um, the first um, chart that you see here is an illustrative capex breakdown uh, for a co-located projects of renewable energy, electrolysis and green steel. Uh, and the main uh, conclusions that you can see here is that the upfront investment cost uh, is shared between various parts of the value chain. So uh, renewable energy capacity, uh, here it's an assumption on 50% solar and 50% onshore wind, represents the, the main part of the upfront investment, 40%. Um, the investment in the new steel making capacity, which you can see in green, is the second largest uh, investment part. And the uh, green hydrogen production itself, so the electrolyzer, is the third item accounting for uh, close to 20%. Here we have chosen a co located project, and therefore uh, the storage and the transport of uh, hydrogen uh, remain limited cost. But in case the projects are not co-located and large infrastructures must be built um, to supply and deliver the hydrogen to the steel making plants, uh, which could be hundreds or thousands of kilometers apart, uh, their share would of course increase. Uh, so this is absolutely key to understand from the investor's point of view uh, that there are that all the pieces need to come together in order to build a profitable business case. Uh, then a second chart to um, illustrate as well the, the analyzed cost here. So this considered the amortization of the upfront investment, but as well all the, all the, the yearly fixed and variable costs uh, that will um, uh, contribute to the final cost of the green steel. Uh, so from the left to the right, we can see first the major contribution of electricity costs and uh, the electrolyzer, the investment in electrolyzers in order to reach the hydrogen landed costs. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the hydrogen landed cost contributes to close to 40% of the final cost of green steel uh, with our assumptions. And uh, that means that uh, having a competitive advantage in the locations 
uh, where the hydrogen is produced and where the renewable electricity is produced will be a major competitive advantage as well to produce uh, green steel. Uh, then on the second part of the, of the chart, on the right side, um, all the green columns corresponds more to the uh, steel making side itself, uh, where you can see that the, the capex plays, of course, a major role. Uh, and the OPEX is driven by the cost of raw materials and operational excellence, which is quite similar to what already exists in today's process. And um, the key questions when looking at all these steps will be how uh, to take measures to reduce the cost of uh, each of these bars, and especially the, uh, the one uh, on, on contributing to the cost of green hydrogen, but also how to make the projects investable if the total uh, production costs of green steel produced through this uh, DRI EEF route remains higher than conventional steel such as um, blast furnaces. So a few measures that we will also um, identify uh, in the next slides uh, are possible. For instance, public procurement to ensure that all the steel used in public buildings and public infrastructures, for instance, needs uh, to achieve a certain um, level of CO2 emissions, so to make sure that this is uh, low embedded CO2 steel that is used in these projects. Uh, another way uh, to uh, create a level playing field is to have a carbon price. So there are many options that exist, uh, but the the bottom line is uh, to identify and implement measures in countries uh, to make sure that the projects are investable. Um, so then the, the main lessons learned from our case studies, uh, so we have uh, ranked them in, in four different categories. Um, so here, the, as mentioned, the, the purpose of the case studies was really to identify uh, what were the success factors of pioneer green hydrogen projects by discussing with companies that have developed them or are in the process of developing large-scale projects. So um, first of all on business models, so the main challenges uh, identified by the actors are the first, uh, the high capital requirements to, to develop them, but as well the uncertainty on both volumes and uh, revenue. So for instance, developing green hydrogen, a large-scale green hydrogen projects requires to identify uh, the off-takers. And for this reason, uh, most of the first uh, large-scale projects uh, that we have seen in our case studies for green hydrogen or green hydrogen derivatives and green goods rely on a mature value chain and on existing markets. So. Uh, for instance, um, H2 Green Steel announced in, in May uh, 2022 that they had signed long-term contracts with volume commitments over five to seven years with customers from various industries for their um, future green steel of the plant in, in Boden in Sweden. So the aggregated pre-sold volumes that they have announced reached 1.5 million tons per year of steel which is already 60% of the plant's future production capacity. Um, the second category are the enabling market conditions and the, the, risk, the risking investment uh, measures that have been implemented or that can be put in place uh, to reach final investment decisions. So the first conditions mentioned by uh, the companies are the need to have an access to low cost and stable renewable electricity, as it's the main driving factor of the cost of green hydrogen, but also on land, water, and more generally infrastructure, such as uh, the power transmi transmission lines, uh, the railways to facilitate the logistics, the deep sea harbor to facilitate uh, exports. Uh, so there are a wide array of uh, conditions, uh, of these preconditions that are required by project developers. And one example here is uh, the case of uh, hyphen hydrogen energy, um, as they will develop in Namibia a common user infrastructure that will encompass a desalination plant, water pipelines, 
electricity transmission lines and hydrogen pipelines and an ammonia storage and export facility. And the, the purpose of this common user infrastructure is also to benefit all the following projects to facilitate the scale up of hydrogen production. Um, so another enabling uh, condition is of course the, uh, the existence of green mandates or blending obligations to, to address off-take risk, as mentioned in the previous slide, carbon pricing can also contribute to it. Uh, and here um, we can uh, highlight it by the choice of HIF Global to produce e-fuels e in uh, Abu Oni. Uh, so as mentioned, they will start with e-gas lines, but they can potentially expand to sustainable aviation fuels, for instance, in the future, um, as they anticipate that uh, the clean fuel markets will emerge supported by blending obligations, uh, for instance, for aviation. Um, so on project governance, we have uh, noted that many developers mentioned the, the role of public-private partnerships uh, specifically to develop uh, the hubs and the infrastructure. Uh, and many project developers also rely on vertically integrated uh, projects or partnerships. So we have highlighted in the preliminary presentation of the case studies uh, the case of companies that will build their own uh, wind or solar power capacity. But this can also be done uh, by uh, working together with uh, a power generation company. And uh, the example of H2 Green Seal uh, here enables to illustrate it, as um, they will rely, um, in their case, in the availability of cheap and stable renewable electricity in North Sweden, which is mainly uh, hydro in that case. And they have announced in June 2022 a seven-year contract with uh, the energy company Statkraft to secure two terawatt hour per year of renewable electricity supply for their green steel facility. Uh, so, and uh, last but not least, so the on the financing side, um, so um, the large ticket size of, of the large scale projects often requires to share risk among actors. And uh, this is something that uh, can be enabled by blended finance, which I will uh, explain more in details in the next slide. Uh, in terms of structure, uh, project finance uh, was the preferred option for most of the developers we have met, uh, which is replicating, for instance, the trend that uh, has been observed in the offshore wind industry in over the last decade. So typically, uh, the structure that was used by the project is to have a holding company acting as an investment vehicle for equity investors, and then special purpose vehicles, uh, SPVs, created for each new project. And um, of course, considering that green hydrogen is still perceived as a risky investment um, because of the high costs, the uh, risk related to uh, securing output with customers, the existence of a market, etc. The first project will likely require a higher equity share than um, other uh, infrastructure or energy projects. And uh, for this reason, several companies also highlighted the opportunity to recourse to capital increase um, or uh, to uh, issue green bonds at the holding level. Our case studies um, shed light on the opportunities seized by project developers and industrial actors to build robust business cases. Yet, they also emphasize the need for policymakers and financial institutions to support the industry by defining a long term strategy and structuring the sector, establishing market measures, and providing the risking and financing instruments. Even though all stakeholders have a role to play to facilitate the market creation and market growth, we focus on this slide on example of actions that policymakers can take. I won't describe all the measures that are uh, listed here and are based on various policy toolboxes, uh, but this is mainly to highlight um, that many actions along the value chain can be implemented. So to take an example, uh, contracts for difference for hydrogen 
compared to its fossil based fossil fuel based counterparts. Um, and viability gap funds can reduce the uncertainties on price and revenues for project developers, especially at the market creation phase. However, uh, given the amount of investments of large scale projects, uh, and given the scarce public finance, especially in emerging and developing economies, it will be necessary to unlock and mobilize private finance to scale up, as it will represent uh, the lion's share of the investment. So this could be enabled by a titled use of blended finance uh, that we have listed um, here on the right side of the, of the slide. And public finance is meant to be applied for projects uh, rather close to commercial maturity where technical and execution risks are limited. Of course, to get the first, first of a kind projects off the ground, uh, a higher degree of public support and a higher degree of concessionality might be uh, required uh, with the purpose that they would decrease over time. Uh, indeed, the support of blended finance should be time-bound until, for instance, a certain capacity is achieved or until uh, project developers have proven the ability to produce green hydrogen below a certain price. Um, and that is the reason why the success of blended finance instruments also require to demonstrate a long-term commercial sustainability, hence the importance of the enabling market measures. Um, however, blended finance is a broad term, which includes many different financing approaches and uh, many different possibilities of uh, vehicles and structures. Uh, and moreover, the clean energy sector is also uh, broadly defined. Um, as mentioned earlier, there is not necessarily a clear definition for what uh, green hydrogen is, and there is a need to develop standards. Um, this is why at the OECD, on top of our work on green hydrogen, we have also developed a guidance on blended finance for clean energy. Uh, where we build upon best practices to explore barriers to investments in several subcategories of clean energy, uh, including uh, green hydrogen, and we identify bespoke financial instruments that can help overcome these specific barriers. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation, and uh, I am happy to participate participate now to the Q&A session. Thank you. We have listened for a very interesting presentation from Joseph, and now we have many questions from the audience. We have selected a couple of questions which are interesting to most of our listeners. And the first question is, how can carbon tax affect the competitiveness of green hydrogen and its derivatives? Carbon pricing can create level playing field for green hydrogen compared to fossil fuels or fossil fuel based hydrogen. This can be enabled by various approaches of carbon pricing, including a carbon tax. Overall, the carbon pricing internalizes negative climate externalities. Therefore, implementing a carbon tax would make green hydrogen competitive with polluting fuels currently used for a wide range of applications. For instance, um, and according to a um, survey and study by McKinsey, applying a carbon tax of $100 per tonne of CO2 in a country where green hydrogen can be produced at $2.5 per kilogram would provide a sufficient price signal to switch from diesel to green hydrogen for various mobility applications, as well as in uh, diesel-based electricity production, um, which is still in place in some emerging economies, uh, including all the um, island countries. Just a side note um, that in the context of the current energy crisis, natural gas prices have skyrocketed and it could already make green hydrogen profitable, but the investment decisions rely on long-term forecasts of the prices 
and what we observe now may be short-lived. For that reason, uh, implementing a carbon tax could provide incentives to investors to switch from natural gas to green hydrogen in their industry, uh, and that can be implemented, for instance, for ammonia, uh, irrelevant of, irrespective of the current market prices. Um, however, and this is especially valid for developing and emerging economies, assessing the impact on end consumer is essential to minimize the adverse economic and social consequences of a carbon tax or any other carbon pricing instruments, as they will basically uh, increase the prices of all the goods produced from um, these processes. This can affect, in particular, vulnerable households and consumers. Even though many studies assess that the impact may remain limited at the end of the value chain, this needs to be evaluated in the local context and for each application. Therefore, integrating the carbon pricing in two wider policy packages will be crucial to increase the political acceptability of um, tools such as um, a carbon tax. Thank you, Joseph, for your detailed answer. The next question is, what do you see as the main bottlenecks today exist in developing green hydrogen related projects from a technological and from the financial point of view? Green hydrogen technology is becoming increasingly more mature, although of course challenges remain to scale up the projects, to diversify the applications, and to optimize the whole value chain. However, in our report, we have focused a bit less on the technical bottlenecks. Therefore, we identified two main categories of barriers. Uh, first, the lack of an enabling policy environment, and second, the bankability of the project. We believe that we first need an enabling policy environment and provided that this is the case, then the financing from both public and private sources will be needed to improve the bankability of projects. In our report, we provide a checklist through various categories to identify barriers all along the value chain. For instance, the competitiveness of renewable electricity is crucial to produce green hydrogen at low cost. And if a country faces higher renewable electricity costs compared to the existing fossil-based electricity generation, then specific measures must be taken to foster the development. For instance, contract for difference or renewable obligation certificates for energy suppliers. The availability of the renewable electricity capacity will be a critical prerequisite for green hydrogen, especially considering that the renewable capacity will probably be developed first for direct electrification and then for green hydrogen application. Similarly, an example of barrier in terms of policy environment or lack of policies uh, is if the national gas code does not include any aspects on the hydrogen transportation, which will be a major obstacle to build a hydrogen network countrywide. In terms of business cases, um, it's important to note that the project developers cannot always rely purely on commercial finance. Indeed, the private, the private banks and lenders often consider green hydrogen to be still too risky, and the public financing and concessional financing will be much needed to de-risk the first projects. So we doubt, for instance, a country platform that is developing blended finance solutions or without specific instruments such as a viability gap fund, it can prove extremely difficult to reach final investment decisions. Thank you, Joseph, again. I see we already have a very interesting discussion here. The next question is, what role do the national and local governments, municipalities, play in the facilitation and implementation of green hydrogen projects. It is a major challenge to understand how to bring global commitments 
to, glo to local action. So the global roadmaps provide very helpful foundations to identify technologies and share knowledge, which is key to accelerate. Yet, they need to be tailored to answer the specific needs of each country and each subsector to get projects off the ground. This will contribute to better understand the specifics of the country regulations and propose ad hoc measures to build an investable environment for green hydrogen. From the angle of the industry, we highlighted in the report the need for infrastructures and that can very often be handled at local level, for instance, through industrial clusters or port areas. The concept of Hydrogen Valley has emerged in recent years to overcome the limitations of individual projects by building hubs and cluster. And they often rely on public-private partnerships where the local governments play an important role. So far, 19 countries, 11 in Europe, 4 in Asia, 2 in South America, uh, the United States and Australia, have identified hydrogen valleys um, to cover multiple steps of the hydrogen value chain and more than one end-use sector in large-scale projects. Combining these various uses within the same area can create the synergies, help achieve the economies of scale, optimize costs and reduce the demand variation. Uh, regarding uh, the policy, what we have observed so far is that in most of the cases, uh, the work is done at national level for the moment. However, depending on the country context, state governments or municipalities can facilitate the implementation of green hydrogen projects. Uh, for instance, by defining a local green hydrogen policy, this is what Tamil Nadu in India has announced in 2022. Or by enforcing stringent local regulations, sometimes going beyond the national requirement, for instance, on air pollution. That's clear, Joseph. What is the role and perspectives of SMEs, medium and small size enterprises, in the development and implementation of green hydrogen projects? As we're still at the early stage of the green hydrogen market development, uh, there is a place for pure players, which can be new companies um, to act as project developers, and this is what we observed in our case studies. Um, but although these companies are today's MSMEs, most of them have the ambition to grow. Um, therefore, in order to assess where can the MSMEs uh, play a role uh, in the development of the green hydrogen market, we believe that this is more a value chain uh, consideration. All the development and the provision of services, equipment, coupling the hydrogen sector with power sector, etc., will rely on SMEs intervention um, and with a mix of uh, different families of SMEs that will contribute to this. In the manufacturing sector, uh, especially in emerging economies, MSMEs represent the largest share of employment. And an example um, for the green hydrogen market will be in the manufacturing of the subparts of electrolyzers. Although big companies have announced uh, gigafactories, they are typically focusing on the assembly of the electrolyzer itself, but many smaller companies will be needed to design, manufacture and deliver uh, the subparts for the electrolyzers. Thank you, Joseph. I understand you are very tired after this presentation and all these questions, but let me to ask you the final one question. What role can international organizations play to create an enabling environment? We have identified four main areas where international organizations can support the development of green hydrogen uh, market. First, for technical assistance and sharing best practices. This can help identify suitable technologies, business cases, knowledge gaps, uh, and identify successful projects for replication. It also helps design suitable training and technical assistance programs that will support capacity building, skills development, 
knowledge transfer and innovation program that will be required for the local value chain development. Second, we believe that international organization will help in terms of regulations, codes and standards. Many countries lack institutionalized mechanisms to track the production and consumption of hydrogen and do not have a system to credibly certify its qualities and its climate neutrality. International organizations can provide a stock take of initiatives currently under development and identify what are the main differences between them uh, in order to reach a consensus on the definitions for green for low carbon hydrogen in order to define system boundaries and as well emission intent, intent, intensity thresholds. Third, uh, we believe that uh, international organizations will help in organizing the international dialogue. For instance, the alignment of environmental regulations, industrial policies, trade rules and carbon prices will be required. Uh, and this is what we have observed in case of the carbon border adjustment mechanism of the European Union to avoid carbon leakage. And the purpose is, of course, that companies uh, do not relocate to countries with less stringent environmental policies. Um, this is a major risk uh, for the first movers in the green hydrogen markets. And the carbon leakage could lead to a loss of competitiveness for producers that remain in the jurisdiction where green fuels and green products are enforced compared to the producers that are manufacturing these products in countries with less stringent policies. Uh, last but not least, um, the international organization can provide financing platforms, uh, for instance, for investment matching. So these platforms could be sectoral, they could develop tools like blended finance facilities, and overall, uh, having the international organizations coordinating this effort could help mobilize climate finance for the green hydrogen projects. On top of this, the platforms can also be used to track the evolution of projects, as well as tracking the financial flows that are going to the green hydrogen. Thank you, Joseph, very much for your presentation and detailed answers. Thank you, audience, for listening to us and your patience. Thank you and goodbye.